I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director at the Long Now Foundation. Uh, as some of you may know, every month we try and choose what we call a long short, a short film that exemplifies long-term thinking. Uh, this month uh, was suggested by one of our own staff, Austin, and uh, the title I was just told translates to Sockology. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting example of uh, choosing your environmental battles. Go ahead and roll it. And the moral is, Alexander? <laughs> Tonight's talk comes from an interesting context. Um, the Nature Conservancy is the largest environmental organization. Um, it's said to be the most trusted environmental organization. And that kind of thing tends to go with a fair amount of conservatism and tried and true practices, they've been enormously successful, so you don't screw around with that. On the other hand, it's the most science-driven of all the environmental organizations. Uh, it has 600 working scientists in it, and who we're hearing from tonight is the chief scientist of all that, and I guess because of the science, because of who he is, uh, this is not conservative thinking. Peter Kareva. I must say I'm a little daunted to be standing up here. Uh, Stuart's been one of my heroes for quite a while. But what I want to do is, we do have 600 scientists, and, and we argue all the time. That's, and we're comfortable with arguing. So I'm going to give you an argument tonight that began with me reading this essay. Uh, some of you may have read it. Uh, it. It's an essay that talks about the, the, the collapse, basically, of the environmental movement, and including the conservation movement. Uh, there have been a lot of other obituaries written about environmentalism, but when I read this, there were parts of it that really, really rang true, and it made me start to think. And so I, it's overstated. You know, these guys overstated it. it the environmental, we're not dead yet, but we are suffering some now. You know, this, we're, we're dwindling. Our numbers are dwindling as a fraction of the population. Our political influence is dwindling. Um, you certainly don't hear 
any candidates for public office really speaking out and taking on the issues. They may take on the issues, but they do it quietly. And so one narrative about that is that, um, oh, it's like the Koch brothers who spent tons of money to stop cap and trade. And yeah, they spent tons of money, but so did the environmental side. In fact, recent analyses suggest the environmental side, the pro cap and trade may have spent more money. So it's not so simple to look at some of our failings by thinking about it just as some sort of evil oppo opposition loaded with cash, you know, just burying us with their advocacy. And so I want to ask, what have we maybe been doing wrong? So what have we been doing wrong? And I'm going to use sort of three sources. My personal experience in conservation where I've been working for 30 years. I'm going to use some data. And I'm used to just some, some stories and, and, and readings. Before we diagnose where we've gone wrong, let's go back to where we were really healthy. I'm sure everybody in this room knows Rachel Carson. Remarkable woman. So she was growing up, you know, 80 years ago, grew up at a, in a, on a small farm. At eight years old, she started writing stories. At 11 years old, she published her first nature article, nature story. Uh, she graduated from in high school with, with a graduating class of 44. Uh, she went on to college and went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins, was really an outstanding biologist. But uh, her, her father died, and she was left as the sole breadwinner for her family, for her, her two sisters and her mother. And in those days, uh, there really wasn't much prospect of a PhD woman getting a job at a university. So he, she had to follow a different career path. She went to work for what has now become the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It used to be the Fisheries Bureau. And she wrote. She wrote for the, for the Fisheries Bureau. She wrote their reports. She wrote for radio shows. And then on the weekends and at night, she wrote and published books and articles. And um, I'm, you all know what she took on. Uh, this is an ad from Time Magazine uh, before Rachel... Uh, found her voice and, and published Silent Spring. But the power of that writing and what she accomplished was, was astonishing. Uh, these, this can really be directly, partially uh, traced to Rachel. She had a, a personal meeting while she was battling cancer in the end with John F. Kennedy's Science Advisory Board and talked to them about some of the issues and how we needed to take better care of the environment. And all of these sort of cascaded out of that. But it wasn't without resistance. Um, if you've, I don't know if you ever read her, her, her um, several biographies about her, but she was cast, there were remarks about uh, her being a really attractive woman and she wasn't married. So the best thing they could say about her in that case was she must be a communist. Um, <laughs> And they said other things. And, and, and she, she was many PhDs. Remember, she didn't have a PhD. Many PhDs attacked her as not being scientific, as being hysterical. The word was hysterical that was used about her. She went on CBS reports and was interviewed. They had 15 to 20 million viewers, which was huge at that time. Basically, everybody was watching in it Sunday night. And she was the one who wasn't hysterical. The uh, PhD scientists were hysterical, and as you all know, she won the day. Her book, you know, quickly, uh, uh, within three months, sold 100,000 copies. And so we have, falling out of that in the, in the 60s, that, um, you know, time passed that uh, many of us, you know, long for, nostalgically, but perhaps without um, much sense of realism, all those acts passed. And now we come to today. And I'm only putting up one piece of evidence. But there are all sorts of polls taken by the Pew, by the Yale Environment School, by the Duke Environment School. Uh, we take polls. And there's no question the trend is towards a decline in support at large for the environment. This is just one of my favorite issues because of the remarks about um, Rachel Carson being hysterical. So, do you agree with the following statement? Most of the people actively involved in environmental groups are extremists, not reasonable people. And 32% in 96, 43% in 2004, and just retaken is a little over 50%. So, uh, that, you know, I'm a scientist. I like to think of myself as reasonable. Where is this coming from? How did we get ourselves 
in this position. Whereas there are a lot of changes going on. Uh, you may, some of you may hope that the blue line is the Democrats and the red line the Republicans. That's not the case. Uh, the blue line is the fraction of the world's population living in cities. The red line is the fraction of the population uh, living rurally. In uh, 2008, they, they crossed for the first time, and most of the world lives in cities, and it's an, ex an inexorable trend towards we're going we're to be a, very much a totally urban world. Well, that has consequences, I mean, for, for how we connect with the environment. There's no question about that. This is one of my favorite uh, statistics. Uh, and Richard Louv has written about this. A lot of people have written about this. But basically, there's less and less connection with the environment and with nature. So the college freshmen, today's college freshmen, average less than an hour a week in outdoor play growing up. I bet you almost every one of you sitting out there average more than that. <laughs> every one of you. And I bet you it's a lot more than that. And, you know, that... that uh, you, you, there's only so much you could get about the environment by reading about it. There's another big change. Um, I, I can't see you because of the lights, but I bet you reflect the demography on the left, which is basically uh, whites in the majority for the U.S. That's today. The pie diagram on the right is what is that... By 2050, whites will be in the minority in the U.S. It's already that way in California, by the way. It's already that way in California. But I bet you this audience doesn't reflect that. I bet you this audience doesn't reflect that at all. And so one of the things, this is something really interesting we just did last month. And I'm going to come back to talking about something we're doing in the Conservancy in an experimental way, but we're collecting data on it. We're trying to connect with an urban and different population because we think it's, it's necessary. And so we, um, yeah, it's pretty startling, isn't it? So uh, let me tell you who this is. This is Oakland, San Antonio, and New York City. Focus groups in those three places, only those three places. New York City, Oakland, and San Antonio. So you're Hispanics, Asians, uh, and African Americans. And uh, that was the question. We want you to imagine a person that cares about nature. Describe that person. I love that picture. That's, um, that's perhaps my daughter, I think. But, um, except she's blonde. Um, but, but isn't it, I mean, look at that. Preaches, preaching. We're very preachy. Uptight. Uptight. And that's certainly, you know, that's how we appear. This new urban generation. Now let me talk about my, a little bit from my personal experience. In the 80s, um, I got involved in litigation as an expert witness for the Sierra Defense Legal Fund, and I, was, uh, I thought I was some sort of eco-hero. Um, you, you know, I was young, maybe 35, 36, and, and I would go into the courtroom, and I thought I was saving the old growth forest, and... and I was pretty smug with myself. Thought it was just a wonderful thing to do. And I was taking all this extra time, and I would study late at night so I could be good on the witness stand. But in one of the, this is a federal court, Judge Dwyer ran it, federal court in downtown Seattle. And um, uh, one of the days I went in there, and at the back of the room, courts, you know, obviously maintain order, but in the back of the room were a bunch of loggers, and they, and they had signs hung over them. They, they can't speak up. They can't interrupt. Signs, uh, uh, that said, um, you care more about owls than my children who are going hungry. And they had their kids on their shoulders. You know how you carry your kids on your shoulders? And they shook them and pulled their things, and the kids would cry. <laughs> you know, you can't, can't throw the kids out for crying. I mean, it's not. Uh, but it was very effective. It was just ironic that that's, my kids were exactly the same age. I mean, they were exactly, they were at the age where I was walking around, you know, you carry your kids on your shoulders, and you, and you hold them like that. And it just sort of, it, it really just squashed any sort of smugness I had and any sense of how one-sided the issue was and how I was wonderful in saving the world. And it, and it really made me think differently. And one of the other things I, I noticed is how often do we talk about the planet as being fragile? 
You know, anytime CNN sends Anderson Cooper to an environmental disaster, he stands in the middle of it and says, fragile marsh, fragile river, fragile forest. If you go to the websites, uh, my organization included Nature Conservancy, WWF, Conservation International, BirdLife International, and scan their websites when they talk about habitats, you will see it's, it's almost like they can't say a word about an ecosystem without prefacing it with fragile. And that might seem, you know, who cares? Who cares that they do that? Maybe it doesn't matter. But it does matter because when things are fragile and you're convinced that they're fragile, it puts you in a position where you do not negotiate. Because it might be, you know, if you just give a little, it's fragile. It'll be broken like that. And it, it forces us to, into these situations where it's always fish versus humans. It's not fish and humans. It's miners versus tree huggers. It's farmers, endangered farmers versus endangered, you know, smelt. Over and over again, it's an either or, or situation because nature's fragile. It can't tolerate any of this activity. I'll come back to the science on this in a little bit. But I, I just want to just think about how often in the news media or on the websites you see that word fragile. I bet you you've used it. I've used it. And it, it, it forces us to do what is called for, fortress conservation. If nature is fragile, then you keep people out. You keep it away. And, you know, if nature is fragile, as I said, no room for compromise, you hire armed guards. I don't think when Rachel Carson was thinking of environmentalism, she was thinking of armed guards. But in Africa, uh, you know, you set up parks, you have to have armed guards to catch the poachers. In fact, that's common. I mean, I, I've seen for uh, many international conservation projects a big part of the budget for armed guards. You basically have an army around it. And it's tragic when that happens. This should have been a really good story. This was a wonderful national park being set up in the 80s in Uganda, um, you know, roughly a little bit earlier than our spotted owl trials. Seemed well intended, but what happened is they forcibly evict, evicted about 5,000 families because nature's fragile, get the people out. Forcibly evicted them, created a furor. Governments changed and they let the the, the population back in, and the population was so pissed off and so upset with the whole thing that they just slaughtered the wildlife. And why did they slaughter the wildlife? They didn't want their lands being gazetted, being mapped as a national park to protect wildlife that they couldn't live in. Places It was their traditional land. That's not the way forward for conservation. Mount St. Helens, this is not human caused, but it was one of the scientific experiences that made me think about fragile, this um, eruption and following the rush, eruption, as you might expect, biologists rushed out there to study it. And that plant on the left there, a little tiny lupin, was one of the very, very first plants. And I was, I, I swear there were a hundred biologists around that with measuring sticks and, and, and everything. Um, I mean, we, there was just a wash with biology. We were all out there. Well, I studied Mount St. Helens along with a lot of colleagues. And uh, if you get a chance, you know, it's, it's a terrific place to visit this summer. You could, uh, wonderful hikes there. But when you go there, you'll be so overwhelmed by how well that's bounced back. And, uh, you know, my, th that eruption was the equivalent of uh, about a 10 bombs the size of which we dropped on Hiroshima. In keeping with that theme, this is the hydrogen bomb test we did in the Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. It's a photo of that. It vaporized islands. It boiled the ocean. Boiled it. National Geographic recently sent an expedition to look at what the coral looks like. There's 25% more coral there than there ever was before for previous six. I, I'm not saying I'd eat the coral. But nonetheless, still, the resilience of it, uh, it, I mean, obviously it bounced back partly because humans um, weren't there to, to fish and, and, and to do it damage, but still the resilience of it is remarkable. They were shocked. 
um, Chernobyl. Chernobyl's now been declared a wildlife refuge because it's got bear, it's, you know, it's got um, Javalski's, the, the horse, the, the horse that you see there is the subspecies of horse. It's, it's, you know, basically from Mongolia, what Genghis Khan rode across it, conquered the world with. But it's an amazing horse. It thrives and breeds there. There's all sorts of major large vertebrates that don't, aren't anywhere else found in any numbers that are thriving in uh, this haven, this natural park. This is from San Francisco, peregrine falcon. Again, it was once on the brink of extinction. There's a lot of species that were on the brink of extinction that we've brought back. Maybe not as many as we'd like, but still a lot that we have brought back. This is one of them. And now it delights many of us when you can see it swoop down and nail a pigeon. Um, I was just in Montana last week. We had our board meeting in Montana. Uh, it w there wasn't this much snow there then, although there's a lot of snow this year. Um, but you can go to Montana now. 15 years ago, you couldn't go, but you can go to Montana now. And as sort of a wildlife tourist, you, could, it's, you can count on, if you know the right places and the right time to go, of seeing wolves and coyotes and grizzly bears and bison. It's not a rare thing. You can count on it. Unheard of, you know, two decades ago. Absolutely unheard of. Ah, you all know this photo. This was one of those photos that was uh, where Anderson Cooper, you know, stood and weeped in the marshes of Louisiana uh, talking about the fragile ecosystem. But the data... Obviously, this is a huge environmental problem and does severe damage. But there will be recovery. And in fact, when Jane Luchenko, who's one of the longest standing conservationists there is, stood up and showed this chart, she got massacred by the media. This chart basically showed data that told us that bacteria were eating that oil much faster than we thought. Why were they eating the oil? I mean, just like oil is a good energy source for us, it's a damn good energy source for bacteria. And there's a constant, huge volume of oil seeping in, that, in the Gulf, naturally. Not anywhere near as much as that oil spill, but it's a constant supply. You have a rich fauna of highly evolved bacteria, you consume it, and the water temperature's warm. In Exxon Valdez, you didn't have that recovery. Water temperature's cold. But she showed this data, and it was like a conspiracy. Because it wasn't damaging enough. Somehow we were disappointed that it wasn't as destructive as we, you know, it's almost like we hoped for it to be that much of a, of a disaster. And hoped for the ecosystem to be that fragile. Now let's look at some of our, our icons. Uh, obviously, Henry David Thoreau is a sort of an icon, goes out into the, wil the wilderness, only he really didn't go out into the wilderness. He went to a pond in a cabin, you know, not too many miles away from Concord, and as a you know, as a kid, he, he set one of the most destructive fires by accident in uh, outside Concord. So he's a very troubled youngster. <laughs> Another trub troubled, you know, young into the wild person that met a not so happy fate as Henry David Thoreau. Uh, you may have seen the movie or read the book, but another sort of, I mean, this is a journey, you know, going out into the wild and uh, for self discovery. But I want to draw attention to Edward Abbey because I read him when I was in college and I was inspired. I thought it was great. And there's a lot to, to, to admire about Edward Abbey, but there is one part that I now feel cheated by. And he also painted this image of man alone in wilderness. It's always man, by the way, but man alone in wilderness, you know, by themselves with the loveliness of it. And so let me read you from Edward Abbey. I wait, now the night flows back, the mighty stillness embraces and includes me. I can see the stars again, and the world of starlight. I'm 20 miles or more from the nearest fellow human, but instead of loneliness, I feel loveliness. Loveliness and a quiet exaltation. Look, go to his personal journals, written at the same time. At his personal journals, same time, he writes in them, oh my God, why did Rita leave me? Why did Rita leave me, his wife? Why did she have to go back to New Jersey? I'm so lonely. 
In fact, he never mentions it there. He's so lonely the first year, they had his family with him the second year. They don't appear in the book. They don't appear in the book. What is this myth? This is going to uh, upset some of you, but I think part of the issue is we have to face some of our metaphors and some of the things we use. John Muir, certainly a hero for conservation. John Muir did not have very pleasant views about Native Americans and African Americans. John Muir on Native Americans, a strangely dirty and irregular life, these dark-eyed, dark-haired, half-happy savages lead. And don't um, forget, um, when Yosemite was created, we kicked the Native Americans out. We actually had to have a Fort Garrison there, Garrison troops. And then John Muir on African Americans, Negroes are easygoing and merry, making a great deal of noise and doing little work. One energetic white man working with a will would easily pick as much cotton. Those are our conservation heroes. And you wonder why we get some of the disenfranchised urban youth? This is much less disturbing, but no less wrong-headed. And it's our anti-technology bias. Um, one of the things that's really always bothered me, I was originally trained in, in an agricultural school, was how conservationists, if, if you're interested in protecting habitat, one of the first things you do is you say, how do we lose habitat? The primary source of losing habitat is agriculture. Is agriculture. And yet conservation organizations don't seem to deal with agriculture. Don't, don't seem to, you know, get that we have to feed the world and that we have to find a way to feed the world because that also helps us do a conservation. No question about that. And how, well, how can they hold that idea in their head and then be just knee-jerk anti-genetic engineering? Now, genetic engineering is not necessarily the answer for everything, and it's got risk, and it should be regulated for sure, but there are cases, and I'll come back to them, where it might help us. But somehow, we get religious about this. In fact, the Nature Conservancy finally uh, we, you know, we came to grips with this, that, that you can't really do conservation without taking agriculture seriously and actually trying to help agriculture do its job. You just can't. In fact, when uh, Michelle and I wrote a, we wrote a conservation biology textbook, actually it's conservation science, not biology, but everybody else on their, on their textbook has pictures of animals and pandas and tigers, and we put a picture of a farm on a conservation textbook because we think that's part of the key. And I already mentioned this, there is this religiousness about um, the environmental movement, and these are just some images that capture it. I had to give a talk at the New York Academy of Science maybe a month ago, and when I mentioned um, that, that we might consider genetically modified organisms, two people in the audience got up. They didn't ask me questions. They didn't want to discuss it. They just walked out angry. And, you know, that, come on, all right, let, let's have a discussion. You can disagree with that opinion, but we could talk about it with evidence, with data. It's, 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 this isn't a religion, and it shouldn't be a religion. And then there's this final thing. It's, it's what I call, you know, we have a, an amazing affection. It, what would I call it? It's sort of like everything's going to be dead tomorrow. You know, um, somehow we seem to like telling that story. The empty oceans, uh, you know, birds, empty skies with birds, and usually when you look deeply, it's not the case. In fact, in every one of those, in both those examples, it's not the case. And we can talk about the science behind it. I first came into this um, after I had been at a university, and I'd been with spotted owls. I then went to work on salmon conservation. And this was a full page ad taken out in the New York Times about extinction of the Chinook salmon in the Snake River. And uh, virtually every environmental group signed on to it. Nature Conservancy didn't, I'm proud to say. They actually called me and asked me what the science was. I wasn't working for them at the time, but they called me and um, said, don't sign it, because it's not true. Uh, and it was ridiculous. Salmon is a little bit of a weedy species. This, this says uh, that for certain by 2017, if we, take out, if we don't take out the dams on the Snake River, the Chinook salmon will be gone. Well, we're not, the dams are not going to be get out by 2017. And I'll bet anybody, their house, that there would be Chinook salmon there. In fact, I made that bet 
when this ad came out. And, and, I, and you know, sort of the sad understory of this, as I went out with the biologists for some of the environmental groups, and um, I said, you guys should know better. You know, you're looking at the same survival data I am. And uh, I won't name it, the, the group, but one of the biologists said, yeah, but last year was our best fundraising year. So my caricature, and this isn't fair, is, is we can look misanthropic, anti-technology, dogmatic, anti-growth, purist, zealous, exclusive, and romantic pastoralism. And all that we ever do is say, stop, 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 don't, don't, don't. Now, obviously, you know, that's a caricature. It's a cartoon. Um, it's, it's unfair as a cartoon is calling you the fragile, but there's parts of it that ring true to a lot of our audience that we need to convince. And so, you know, the way forward is to restore, reconnect, be people-oriented, community-oriented, growth and opportunity, technology, green infrastructure, greening business. And you see these messages picking up, but I still don't think we're aggressive enough about it. In other words, not about what you can't do, but what about what you can do going forward. And before we do that and talk about specific solutions, you've got to deal with the facts about the state of the planet. Um, and not in a doomsday way, not in a way that, oh my God, everything's going to be dead tomorrow, but to recognize our footprint on the planet is huge. So many of you may have read, this is covered in a lot of the newspapers, there's a push to officially na name this era as a new geological epoch called the Anthropocene, in, in other words, the human epoch, because we so dominate it. And we dom you know, climate change is an obvious one, but uh, you've all seen these pictures, you know, satellite photos about the lights. But there's so many ways we dominate the, the, the planet. Um, you know, we, we take 60% of the water for our uses. We dominate the nitrogen cycle. We use, for, to, to build our roads and our buildings and all that, we move more soil and rocks to build things than all the geological processes that used to move it all. Move it all. You, you know dams. This is the, the Glen Canyon Dam. But behind, there's more water behind dams than there is free running in rivers. You know, and you could see it from the satellite. This is uh, the Three Gorges Dam. You, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a straight line in the lower left-hand corner before that big body of water that's about a mile across. That's a Three Gorges Dam. Huge impact. You know, there's, more tre there's more trees and plantations than there are in forests now. So we dominate the planet. But let's not, you know, I, I, I don't say that to, to say, oh, my God, it's horrible, because there are still places where there, there is some wildness, but there's no place that's pristine. It's untouched. You go and sample a vertebrate's fatty tissue, you know, Antarctic or Arctic, and you'll see some of our pesticides in that fatty tissue. So that is, let's get over it. That's the way it is. Let's move forward. But don't romanticize this wilderness that really hasn't been with us for a long time. These are the shipping lanes that show, um, you know, where, how, how, how much ships cross the oceans. So I'm sorry to pick on Abby, but you know, when your childhood heroes sort of fall and you fall down, you, know, you get upset. So here's him writing about wilderness. <laughs> wilderness, the world itself is mu the word itself is music. Wilderness, wilderness, we scarcely know what we mean by the term, though the sound of it draws all whose nerves and emotions. He just goes on and on about wilderness. And he talks, of course, about the desert that he's sitting in in Utah is wilderness. Um, and he describes it beautifully. While he was there, there were 29 atomic tests at the test site. And he described them in his journal. He didn't put them in the book in the description of the wilderness because it would have messed up the picture he was painting as how untouched it was. We can't seem to accept the world. So going forward, what do we have to do? Well, let's embrace cities. Yeah, we're, of course we're going to protect those wilds and open places. But that's not going to succeed unless we as a conservation um, movement embrace cities. We started to do that. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has an amazing program in New York City. It's been running for I think, 14 years now, and it's, now it's being expanded. We take kids, usually minority kids, from inner city schools, and we take them out and they actually work. This is not fun and games. This is not an environmental education. They work 
on our reserves uh, all over the country. In fact, we have some in Montana this year, working maybe about 14 different states. First time away from home, some of them live in pretty rough, you know, situations, but they, they work outdoors for us, uh, removing invasive species, uh, building trails, helping with fences, helping, uh, usually they work for scientists, collecting data, recording data. It's an amazing program. It's one of those, you know, you meet these kids, you go out with them, and, it, you, and it's, you, you feel really good about it. But listen to some of the things they say beforehand. I know I look ghetto, but I care about nature too. My grandma said not to go in the woods because that's where they hang people. Are you going to reject me because I'm, in a, I'm a Muslim? They're really afraid. You get them in the first day, they're afraid to do this. No question about it. They've had a lot of success stories. So on our, our magazine, we show this kid, Josh Carrera, who, who was uh, you know, homeless for a while, and now he's a star in college. Um, he, we show these pictures of elation. But what's more interesting to me, because I'm a scientist, is the numbers. I think many of you may know that the U.S. is falling behind in science and technology. Other countries are doing much better. 6% is the percentage of college majors who, are in, who major in science. Our kids, because these are kids that went through the program, they went through the program in high school uh, a while back, and we follow them, it's greater than 30%. There are massive federal programs trying to get kids into science, and none of them will achieve this rate, guaranteed, because they do it outdoors. I had to throw this in. I don't know if, they, if this has hit the newspapers yet, because I haven't had a chance to... to the newspapers. This was published in Nature maybe four days ago. It's a premier scientific journal. Fascinating um, about uh, how about life experience, whether you live in a city now and where you grew up, how, how much of your early life was spent growing up in a city. And they looked at the population in cities versus towns versus rural. And you know, previously there have been psychological things where we know schizophrenia is at a much higher rate in cities than in rural populations. But they did MRIs, and they did this really, you know, both wicked and wickedly clever experiment. What they did is, 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 they, is they had people take a test, and it was a test that was too hard, so they couldn't do it. And then they berated them, It's like some of my teachers. But they just said, you know, you're not getting it right, you're going too slow, it's not getting right. And then they took an MRI right afterwards to, to, to see what parts of their brain were acting up. And it turned out that the people who were rural handled the stress pretty well. And the people from the cities or people who, who grew up um, in cities as opposed to rural, you could see a marked difference in their brain imaging. Marked difference. And that's the graph. I mean, those are graphs on the right that scientists like to put up there. But it wasn't subtle. It wasn't a subtle effect. It was a really dramatic effect. So it's getting, it got written up in The Economist. You'll, I think you're going to hear a lot more about this study. Interesting way to do an experiment. But that, you know, come on, we spent 100,000 generations being hunter-gatherers. We've had maybe, you know, a couple hundred generations in our current, you know, settled down town and city thing. Those 100,000 generations have to have sort of hardwired some things in us. So I, I say that, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about, uh, about it, connecting kids with nature is not just about saving nature. It may be about saving the kids. But, um, and, and, and it's possible in cities. My dad was a coal miner in Pennsylvania, and in, early on, I remember he took me to, to Pittsburgh, and my memories of Pittsburgh in the 1950s uh, was not pleasant. I had no fond memories of, of Pittsburgh, and these are, those are some early photos of it. Recently went back to Pittsburgh for an ecological society meeting and ended up running along the river. And what an amazing story of river restoration Pittsburgh has done with the three rivers that sit there. Beautiful. You know, it used to be so polluted, you didn't, people didn't want to own land along, around it. You're, it was so corrosive, your boats would corrode. There's no fish in it. It was sludgy. And now they have a bass fishing tournament there. A real success story. Closer to home, Guadalupe River. Um, this isn't the nicer part of it. Near the airport, you can see a, it's, it's, it's much better. But I um, have been coming to California for quite a while. I, I have a, a teaching appointment at Santa Clara. And, you know, uh, it's amazing how even this urban river has been cleaned up enough so that you have steelhead in it. 
technology. Genetic modifications in favor of conservation. Two here. Uh, one of the pictures, the American chestnut, which used to dominate our eastern forests, got devastated by a fungus, having a real hard time getting it back, but there's some, you know, you know, some experiments that are very, very promising with genetic engineering, getting genes from other species for resistance to the chestnut blight, to the disease. Are you going to be anti-genetic engineering to say we can't uh, get the American chestnut back, we can't use this genetic engineering, or would you, would you accept it? I personally would accept it. Food. You know, uh, Bill Gates put, put a lot of money in a challenge to trying to, to improve agriculture in Africa. And if you're interested in conservation in Africa, you better be interested in agriculture in Africa. You better be interested in agriculture in Africa. And one of the things that he's placed his bets on that has some real promise is cassava, which right now gets hit by a disease and is not as nutritious. But it, it, you know, in, the, in the greenhouse, they, they've been able to genetically engineer varieties that meet, overcome these obstacles. If he could make that work, a genetically engineered cassava that doesn't require fertilizer, doesn't require water, much more nutritious and resistant to disease, are you going to say no because it's, G, it's a GMO? I hope not. Eleanor Ostrom, the first and the only woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics. What did she win it for? Really interesting piece of work. She looked at, at resource management where normally we think humans do a terrible job. Sort of tragedy the common situations. Forests, marine protected areas, fisheries, grazing, where there's not land ownership, but Tragedy, real tragedy of the commons. And she found that you could get successful, really successful management. Real success stories. She did this scientifically. She didn't cherry pick things. She looked at hundreds and hundreds of case st studies and said, sometimes we get good management and good resources, and other times we destroy it. What distinguishes them? What distinguishes them is the power of community. If a community can see the thing, resources, and has the governance that works together, you get success. And we've seen the power of social networks. But notice the sense of community, how different the sense of community is from an isolated, you know, man going into the wild to discover himself. Doesn't like people. You're not going to get conservation as an individual. I, you, those heroic pictures of the lonely person off by themselves in the wilderness is not how you're ever going to get conservation. It is the power of community. You know, we saw this, the Nature Conservancy saw this, because um, we're working in the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, we, th we, we had no idea what we were getting into. We, we do oyster restoration. It costs about a million dollars a mile of oyster restoration. You restore oyster reefs, you're doing a ton of get good on so many fronts. It's expensive, probably not more expensive than a levy or something. It takes a lot of labor. So we, um, you know, put out the word for volunteers. We were overwhelmed. We couldn't believe how many volunteers would turn up for us. I mean, it was just like, geez, you know, why didn't we think of this before? <laughs> and then this definition of wilderness. Let's not be so exclusive and narrow-minded in what we call wilderness. There's a book coming out by a friend of mine, Emma Maris, that will be coming out um, in August called The Rambunctious Garden. This photo from the book is the um, uh, High Line park that was created in New York. It was an elevated rail, railroad, and then they converted it to a park. But they did it in an interesting way. They landscaped it. They, they allowed some alien species in it. They didn't try to get all the alien species out, but they put in natural species too, and they landscaped it in a very rough and ready way. And it's, it, maybe this photo doesn't show it's beautiful, but if you're there in New York, it actually is beautiful. Look at San Francisco. Where would San Francisco be without you know, the, the Golden Gate Park? Where would it be? It would be a desolate city. Yet, in that, I mean, you start to have wildlife. You, you, stories about coyotes, coyotes, and, you know, why you keep your dog on a leash. That's great. Maybe it's not great that you have to keep your dog on a leash, but it's great that there's coyotes there. Not just, you know, in urban cities, you could flip it around uh, of this notion of wilderness. These are all shots from Indonesia where we work. And, of course, the upper right-hand corner is the pristine old growth, untouched forest, Indonesian tropical rainforest, which we do try to protect. It harbors an enormous amount of biodiversity. 
But we've learned that that you know, symbol of conservation, orangutan, highly threatened species, turns out to do quite well in oil palm plantations. That's, um, that's a, a dart for a tranquilizer. We're not trying to kill the orangutan there. That it's got out of his side. But, um, you know, <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be really in trouble if we did that. <laughs> but it surprised us. It, it just surprised the size of the populations. Now, certainly that does not mean you want the world to go to oil palm. But it tells you you could tolerate, you know, you can have some conversion to oil palm and some old growth, and you'll get more wildlife than you ever expected in the oil palm. It's, not, you know, it's a negotiating point. Just like you talk about relaxing your definitions of wilderness and nature, we should think about infrastructure in a different way. Infrastructure shouldn't just be concrete, canal, you know, uh, canals, levees, water treatment plants. Nature could be infrastructure. We have a number of projects that show that. Um, this is a, a high elevation sort of wet habitat. It's like a sponge if you walk on it. It absorbs water. And all across um, South America, we found that we can get an awful lot of conservation done because people in cities or companies in cities, breweries, florists, hydropower, create funds to pay for conservation upstream. Simple idea. It works. And it's cheaper when you do the economic analysis than the engineering infrastructure. It's significantly cheaper. And we actually, we don't lead with the nature conservation when we propose these projects. We lead with the economic analysis. And I think they'll spread. I think it's viable for Asia. It could even be viable for the U.S. Something that we really don't have working yet, but the Wall Street Journal mentioned it uh, with the Mississippi flooding. So in a traditional, a natural river, you'd have floodplains. Um, the floodplains would handle the extra water. People down, you know, people wouldn't be flooded out of their homes. Those floodplains could often be really good at fish habitats. They also be, there's floodplain agriculture. Around the world, there's floodplain agriculture that works quite well. And we even do a little of it here in California on some of our areas. But Wall Street Journal even mentioned that maybe we should rethink about how we're managing this river and let the natural floodplains take over. So replace those levees, which we had to break because you know, the water was going to crest and even do even more damage downstream. We had to break the levees and, and sort of instantly create a floodplain. Um, I think there's real potential there. We haven't done the economic analysis there yet, but that's something I want to work on personally. Evil companies. I'm not saying Dow is an evil company, but some people would. You've got to be willing to work with the companies. And so this is actually not my slide. This is um, you know, from uh, the Dow CEO, talks about a breakthrough collaboration with the Nature Conservancy. Well, why would we work with Dow? But Dow works in 37 countries, 52,000 employees, hundreds of plants making plastics, chemicals, and egg biotechnology, which has huge demands for water and resources and potentially has huge impacts on the environment. I don't want to call Dow the enemy. I want to work with Dow and figure out if we could change their practices. I'm not naive. It may not work, but I'm not going to say no at the outset at all. In fact, the more, the merrier. The more companies, the merrier. And so maybe this is a cartoon from The Economist. You know, maybe it's a matter of, of finding the economic values and not just speaking to the heart, although the heart is certainly important. The heart is why I'm in conservation. Heart might be why a lot of you are in it. But still, if you're going to mainstream it, if you're not going to be a dwindling minority, speak to the economics, because I think there is a real economic argument to be made. You know, I'm going to wrap up... Uh, a couple of slides, and then we can have some chance for some real argument and discussion. Um, I bet you some of you know this painting, Picasso, um, sort of inspired to, pre to present the horrors of the Spanish War. And you know, the, you have 
humans fighting and animals in there, uh, you know, fighting. And it's, it's just not a very pretty picture. Now, I don't want to be all touchy-feely, you know, all oh, everybody's nice and let's all get along, kumbaya. But in a sense, the environmental and conservation movement has sort of proceeded in the world a little bit too much about this. It's, it, it's, you know, it's always been about limits. It's always been about litigation, uh, you know, painting the other side as evil without listening to them. Greedy, stupid. Um, this is no Picasso, but some of you may know this painting. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it's by a Quaker, um, Edward Hicks. It's called The Peaceable Kingdom. And look at how well everybody's getting along there. <laughs> you know, all right, that's a romantic fantasy. There's no question of that being a romantic fantasy. But certainly given those two, artist, you know, those two competing artistic renditions, um, this is more what we have to get towards. But I don't want to use... Um, you know, a painting. I'm going to use some photos to sort of finish off my argument. So, um, yeah, you know, it is, I, I want wild things. I want to save spectacular species. You know, I love the fact that I could see grizzly bears. Absolutely love it. But, you know, to succeed, we better be able to work really well with Republicans. Nixon, was a conservation hero. He signed the Endangered Species Act. Go back and read the words he said when he signed the Endangered Species Act. In fact, talk about an era gone by. When the Endangered Species Act was signed, it was unanimous in the Senate. Unanimous. Not a single Republican voted against it. The Endangered Species Act. Unanimous. And nowadays, it's gotten so that you know, in the primaries, I, I know from talking this to, to um, you know, Republican politicians, that Republicans in primaries are as likely, if not more likely, get attacked for donating money to a conservation group as they are for their stands on abortion. That's really messed up. And it's not messed up. Don't blame. There's, it's, it's, you know, how we've dealt with it. Sure, they have responsibility, but we have responsibility too. We will get nowhere in conservation if it's Democrats versus Republicans. We just won't. Look at the diversity of that photo. That's what the world looks like. When we turn up the lights and look around the audience, I guarantee you, you don't look like that. Guarantee you, you don't. That's the diversity of people we have to bring to the conservation. And that's going to take work. We're going to have to break down some of those myths of those kids from Oakland and San Antonio and New York City who talked about us as being preachy and uptight. Biotechnology and technology in general. There's a knee-jerk, religious, ideological response against technology among many conservationists. This is a picture of brown and yellow rice where the yellow rice is genetically engineered to have vitamin A, which is really important um, uh, for health in many parts of the world. But, you know, you know Greenpeace um, wanted to block all this. Ardently, you know, just block any sort of genetic engineering of, of the crops. We can't be knee-jerk against technology. You have to evaluate it as a scientist not as an ideologue. And there'll be risk with any technology, but there's also risk to not pursuing it. Corporations and cities. You know, if it's just about conservation and appealing to these spectacular places with the animals that we love, and we don't deal with the cities and, and corporations, um, we're also doomed to failure. So I don't want to, you know, this is an argument I make inside the conservancy, and we're doing, you know, we, we're experimenting with all this. We have an agriculture group. We've started consciously thinking about urban conservation, both in terms of connecting to urban populations, but actually doing river restoration, actually doing conservation in, in, in cities. We're paying attention to the notion of diversity and I haven't been successful quite yet, 
but I'm trying to get us more and more comfortable with, with, with technology. I'd even like us to have on our web page saying something like, I would like us to say something like, genetically engineering, you know, genetic engineering uh, food plants is, you know, a potential option. It could, carries risk, has to be regulated, has to be evaluated, but it's not something you should say no to outright. But um, we'll see. I'll keep arguing. Why don't I stop there? And I hope we have lots of questions that can have a good discussion about some of these ideas. I <laughs> uh, wonder why Kevin put this on top from N. Roberts. Are there any groups the Nature Conservancy would refuse funding from? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so like all, uh, it, you know, probably organizations, we have what we call a, a risk committee. It's standard operating procedures. And there are groups that we would refuse funding from, and it would be if we thought it would be uh, their intent was not at all serious, that it was just sort of a greenwashing thing, it would and it would damage our reputation more than the benefits. So, um, uh, and, and we've had, we do have debates about that. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to have a green car for NASCAR. I thought that would be great. And, um, and um, but I got shot down. <laughs> but, but I still think it's a good idea. So you say the, um argument is of the essence, and you've got 600 scientists. <laughs> uh, what's, what are the, some of the current debates within the scientists within Nature Conservancy? Is it, like, is GMOs a debate, or does everybody think it's a good idea? Or? You know, I think everything that I mentioned is a debate among the scientists, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, the GMOs is a debate. Uh, there's a debate about um, what do we demand of a corporation when we work with it? I actually think, I probably wouldn't say no to any corporation as long as the data were public mm. and you could use it and there were measures in place to see what's happening. So that happens to be my stand. So I really push us to be a little bit more open to corporations, but then to be a little bit, invest more person power and staff in the scene what they actually do. We have a debate about that. We have a debate about alien species and invasive species. We have debate about um, what are the objectives of conservation. What's the nature and the, of the in invasive species debate? Again, so um, the, you know, as many of you probably know, there's, there's um, both internationally and nationally uh, there is evidence that non-native species, alien species, can come in and do severe damage. They're implicated in the extinction of some species, especially on islands, mm -hmm. or ecosystem damage. That's caused a big reaction to try to reduce in alien and invasive species by keeping them out at the borders, mm -hmm. with, by when they come in, trying to control them, and then, in some cases, trying to eradicate them. Probably everybody agrees on that. The debate's a bit more polarized than I, th than I think it needs to be. There's one camp that gets characterized as invasive species are horrific and let's knock ourselves dead and spend all the money in the world and do whatever it takes to get them out even though whatever it takes has its own costs. That's one extreme. The other extreme says, eh, you know, it costs us so much there's better uses for the money, let's relax. Re let's relax. So it's, it's, it's really a debate about the cost effectiveness and the w wiseness of investing in controlling them. So I've had a sense um, that, especially in islands, uh, invasive predators can turn things really seriously upside down. Um, but invasive plants, alien plants, um, basically just increase the biodiversity, like in New Zealand. Is this... But you see, I mean, do plants make other plants go extinct? Um, so what you, your, your depiction of islands is dead on accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, in plants, I'm trying to think, and I, and I may not know the literature, I don't know that many examples of, of them making them go extinct. As you said, you know, now California 
has 25% more plant species now than it had a couple, years, a couple hundred years ago because of invasive species. Alien, alien species have increased our plant diversity. That's a kind of make you think about that. I, I think what... So wouldn't that... Okay, so that's the primary trophic right. level, right? Uh, we get then that many more plants, do we wind up getting that many more creatures living on the plants? Sure. So cases, the whole biodiversity it's... gets enriched, so... Well, not, I, I doubt it cascades through to vertebrates and stuff like that. The problem with, 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 with invasive species plants is they may not cause extinctions, but they can do a lot of damage to rangeland. Right. They could be unedible. They could be, you know, in that case, they're, they're, we, they're, they're almost, in those cases, an economic burden mm -hmm. and an agricultural you know, weed. So that may not cause an, ex that's not a biodiversity argument. That's an economic argument, and that's a valid argument. Does the Nature Conservancy <clears throat> use herbicides against some of these Yes, we, we will use herbicides in some cases. Yep. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. um, Kevin Kelly says, you suggest that environmentalism has become dogmatic and quasi-religious. Are you afraid that religion might add environmentalism to their own dogma? I mean, um, listen, there's some background on this. I've been part of, you know, we did scenario planning with Sierra Club, and we said at a certain, one of the things that emerged from that session was that uh, there was Christians who would like to protect God's creation, and that there was a whole green uh, movement ready to happen from among Christians. So Ed Wilson wrote a whole book right, about that, part, basically. That's right, he certainly did. Uh, Kevin is asking, should we worry? I would, you know, the interesting way, so I think about nature conservation is there's a lot of reasons to do it. There's economic reasons, there's our personal ethical, you know, the inspiration we may take, about, take from it. And I actually think it would be, frankly, great if some religions adopted it. It's part of the diversity thing. In, in a sense, it's broadening the constituency. It, broadening the constituency for conservation means that it's not just you, it's not just us. And, uh, uh, we've had conferences where we've invited, you know, faith-based groups, and it's values. And if, and if religion wants to champion the values of conservation, I'm fine with that. I don't have to agree with their religion, but if that's mo motivating, I'm actually fine with that. All right. Uh, Byron asks, all the news that I read says we're now living through the third greatest mass extinction in the planet's history. Do you have an opinion about this? It seems you discount much of the negative news in the press these days about our environment's decline. Are we having a mass extinction? We're so, so the, you know, the, 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 you know, by all evidence, the uh, extinction rate now is an order of magnitude higher than it, than sort of background levels. Order of two? Order of magnitude. You know, order of magnitude. magnitude. Okay. But, Ten times greater. Yeah. But, on the other hand, there have been claims about the extinction rate that, have been, you know, you've, you've probably seen these, like one species goes extinct every, you know, 20 minutes, that have been uh, a little bit exaggerated. And one of the interesting things is, is that um, when you actually look at the extinctions, you have to ask, you know, have they had those dire, you know, consequences? Chestnut, passenger pigeon, um, those, are, those are not rare species. Those are huge, massive extinctions. And uh, it hasn't actually caused the end of the world. So extinction is, is, is something that I think we want to minimize. We care about it. But it's not quite as apocalyptic as some would say. It has consequences, but I wouldn't say it's as, as apocalyptic. So what happens to Paul Ehrlich's uh, rivets of the airplane model? Uh, is, when I was studying at Stanford in the 50s, the ecological understanding we had was that uh, there's these ecological communities and they're very deeply integrated and they're fragile and uh, any loss uh, of any part of it is a loss to the whole thing. Are you saying that's not the case? Um, so there are, so the river, that's a, it's a compelling metaphor. It's hard to turn off, it's hard to not be persuaded by that metaphor. But if you, if you think about what really goes on, first of all, it's, it's not, it's not an airplane that's flying, it's kind of a jalopy that's rolling along the ground and it could, you know, it's a little bit, not quite such a exquisitely designed thing. The second thing is that species, um, you know, for sure, 
you lose rivets and what you're left with, with is different. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we lost top predators, when we you know, lost wolves initially and grizzly bears, and when we lose tuna in the oceans, it changes. Mm -hmm. But the ocean does not stop you know, functioning as an ecosystem, it's different. And, and, and so I, 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 th I think what's wrong about his analogy is, is the notion that something crashes to the ground and burns and all the passengers die. That's not what happens. It's you get something different, a different ecosystem. So one of the surprising things to me is the idea of this integrated ecological community seems to have sort of passed from ecology and, and species are headed in various directions at various times and it, it's sort of like uh, working in an office where you're really intimate with a lot of people uh, but then you, know, you move on and somebody loses their job and the office carries on uh, without you and it's not like a family where it, it, you know, it's close and perpetual and so are all these species just sort of working at the office? <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> I, I think that's the counter to, uh, mm -hmm. to Paul's metaphor. Mm -hmm. It may well be. You, I mean, I know you studied e e ecology early on, but there was a, it, it still exists. From the 50s onward, there's been a debate about eco ecological systems, and one is about the superorganism, the community, mm -hmm. and the other one is, this is really jargony, the individualistic species. All right. And, and I think... And then on down to the selfish gene. Right. And, and I think now you probably, you know, the, the feeling is more towards the individualistic species. So are all the field biologists that I know are seeing climate change happening in whatever habitat they're studying. And presumably you're seeing the office metaphor play out there because some species are doing one thing with the change of climate, some are doing another, some were dependent on each other in certain ways that at the time things flowered and the bugs arrived and the birds arrived and all that kind of stuff. And that's all in flux. What happens then? Is it, is it just a case where basically the weeds take over until climate change settles down again or what's going on? I think, I think climate change is gonna challenge us thinking about communities in such a profound way, and we do mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. So, supposing you have plants that um, hold soil, so they, they reduce um, dust storms. That's a very important function. That, maybe it doesn't matter which plant species does it, but you need a plant to do that. Climate changes and you lose the plant that currently does it, um, you know, what's gonna replace it? I think, I think we're, you know, in my world, I would start to get proactive about it. I would start there and say, climate change is on us. Let's, you know, let's think about what the grasslands and, for, and you know, arid lands and forests in the future, what do we want them to look like? What functions do we want to make sure we maintain and maybe even help move some species around? The anticipation. So what does adaptive conservation look like? Adaptive in the sense of adapt, ad, adapting to climate change. So what stuff do you have to do? You know, climate, there, it, the environmental and conservation movement uses climate adaptation in two ways. One way is use things like oyster reefs, floodplains, and marshes hmm. to provide adaptation to storms and floods so they do less damage to us. So that's using nature to help protect us instead of lose, using concrete. The other way they use that word, adaptive conference, conservation, is... Um, you know, in the spirit of we're, we want to, you know, we'll give you an example uh, of an idea that's out here that's relevant to California. Um, there's an island scrub jay on Santa Cruz Island. You know, smallest population uh, of, of a bird in North America. Tiny population. Obviously at risk of extinction. Western Nile virus, if it gets to it, Western Nile virus has come to California. If it hit this one population, we could lose the species. Adaptive conservation to me would be, let's create some more populations ourselves. Go in as managers, you know, put some on some other islands to, to uh, anticipate change. So we could, it's, it's being more, pro, not just waiting for stuff to happen to us. Don't wait for stuff to happen to us. Now you mentioned um, American chestnut, which is sort of one of the tragedies that I, my family paid attention to when I was growing up. And I gather the American chestnut was like 40% of the eastern deciduous forest right. at a certain point. 
And you know, it's raining down these sweet nuts that all the animals are living on, people are living on, and then it evaporates and the things carry on. And now you say there's a GMO uh, version of the American chestnut that is poised to come back. Um, so is Nature Conservancy pushing that or standing by or what? <laughs> you know. I, I don't speak for the nature conservancy, but don't forget there was also salmon in the river that you could walk across as well. Um, but <laughs> but um, the, the, you know, so the, it's not ready to, there's research about getting resistance genes, actually inserting them into, into the embryos, so getting uh, chestnuts that are resistant to the fungus that it Do you know where they get the genes from? Uh, a number of different places. One was a daffodil, I can't remember where some of the other places were, but other species. So. That's, a cla you know, that's genetic engineering. You're moving DNA from one species into another. Why do you need genetic engineering? You can't even grow the things up you know, to cross them by the natural ways. Mm -hmm. um, they're at the, 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 the situation where they get it in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. So the next step would be to do field, field trials with it. Um, you know, if, if my boss came to me and said, should we be for or against these field trials, I'd mm -hmm. say we should be for them. Is anybody against them? I'm sure that there that a lot of groups are against them. Boo. <clears throat> or yay. I mean, you know. <laughs> but you know, I, I did hear one uh, complaint about well, gee, if we get a, a, a an engineered successful uh, American chestnut, it it might become invasive. Right. And, and you know, with it, so there's it, it's not just American chestnut. There's a whole Genetic engineering has proceeded very far with crop plants, annual plants, herbaceous plants. And now you, there's a lot of trees mm -hmm. that can be engineered for, you know, biomass, carbon sequestration, mm -hmm. plantation. And uh, people mm -hmm. think about, you know, you worry about weeds. What about in, invasive trees? And um, Chestnuts, we would be glad if they invaded, right? Races, right. right. <laughs> but I, so I think you can, you know, what the National Academy of Science says about this is, is it's not the technology. It's not the fact you move the DNA around, it's the traits. You examine the traits as a scientist and ask, you know, what are the ways in which it can alter the performance of the plant, where might it end up, and what's a do a cost-benefit analysis. So that you'd have to analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis, which isn't that hard. Okay, um, predators. You mentioned passenger pigeons. There used to be something like five and a half billion passenger pigeons right. in North America. Um, one explanation I saw said that's because the, their predators, the Native Americans, had been largely ex extinguished, like 90% extinguished by European diseases, and then the passenger pigeons took off, along with the buffalo. Is that, do you think, the case? Um, it, it's certainly the case with the buffalo. I hadn't actually heard that uh, about mm -hmm. passenger pigeons, but it certainly is. I mean, predators have the capacity to hold populations down to pretty low levels. And you remove, mm -hmm. look at the deer in, in all over the East Coast. You know, um, it, it, predators have a real ability to, to control their prey populations, and you get rid of the predators, and you get a plague almost of the prey. So you've got to have people behaving like predators to keep the deer down, so bow hunting in town is a good idea. <laughs> in the garden, twang, right. check that. Um, one more thing on the passenger pigeon. Um, the last one died in 1914, was stuffed and sent to the Smithsonian. There's several other stuffed ones. There's one at Harvard that I know of, one in Ottawa. So there's plenty of tissue there for presumably really good intact DNA. Mm -hmm. You know where this is going. <laughs> 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 and I've talked <laughs> with uh, bioengineer George Church about this, and he says it looks like the closest um, genetic relative is the band-tailed pigeon, which there's plenty of. And that basically you could, uh, once you have sequenced both of them, start tweaking the band-tailed to become the passenger pigeon and bring this extinct, totally iconic species back to life. Um, what do you think of that? <laughs> so I think, I mean, you and I have had a little bit of this discussion before, but um, I knew he wasn't going to completely turn blue. But no, I'm curious. No, no. So you know, you you have one side of conservation that is about preserving the past, 
And then you have the other side of conservation that is about building a future. What do you want the future to look like? Preserving the past is, is impossible because of so much change. Mm -hmm. Doing all, all only about the future is dangerous because you, do, you would add, potentially end up with a Jurassic Park. You know, you can, in your, your hubris, your, your arrogance as a scientist, you could sit there and say, I want, you know, I, you know mammoths, Neanderthals, I'd like Neanderthals. Um, you know, let's get all of these things back and let's create a spectacular future. You know, I'm a little bit, frankly, leaning towards a little bit preserving the future. I, I would like to see a discussion of the, that passenger pigeon. Although I'm not sure I'd start with the passenger pigeon. There's other species like the Tasmanian devil and things like that. Predators. That, you're predators. Gonna, I like, I, you know, that yeah, I would think about yeah. more. California grizzly. You're going to bring the California <laughs> grizzly back, a known man eater. Right. <laughs> Can we tweak it so that it's afraid of people like <laughs> right. one but I, I mean, that's I, reasonable, right? Can we do that? I don't know. <laughs> we do know how that you know there's some simple genes involved with domesticating animals, but um, but but I <laughs> and probably humans. And if we silence those genes, we go feral again, right? right. <laughs> this could well, be that, interesting. That's the hippo. That's the the brain image. <laughs> I've all we saw some people in uh, in Aspen at the environmental forum there, and uh, one guy was saying that, uh, well, you know, chickens are basically dinosaurs, <laughs> as we all know, and if you could sort of basically silence the chicken genes and bring out the emergent dinosaur, we can bring back the dinosaurs. They're predators, some of them, okay? Uh, Dan asks, are factory farms more sustainable than low-density organic farms? Now that you're focusing on agriculture, you're going to have questions like that. You know, that's a, you know, so the, the, the whole um, issue of farming is, a, is, a, is one of those issues that has gotten ideological as, as opposed to, a, you know, evidence or data-based. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of thing we're going to have to look at. I'm not ducking the question, but one of the interesting mm -hmm. things is, is um, you know, doing that accounting. Uh, land use, energy use, water use, not just land use, it's water use, and, and pollution. I feel like both sides in, the, in this debate don't speak from evidence, they speak from belief. And I don't actually n know the data that well, but when I've looked, it's, it's, it, I've often found surprises, like grass-fed beef is one example, or you know, mm -hmm. si situations like that. What's, what about grass-fed beef? So, so grass-fed beef is, is an example where the USDA just uh, you know, decided to put a label on what is called grass-fed beef. You all know, I mean, grass-fed beef, uh, is, is healthier for you, much healthier for you. And, um, and for the landscape, I think. And for the landscape, no mm -hmm. question about that. But they put a label on very dogmatically. And they said it's going to be grass-fed if it absolutely is only grass-fed. Um, that makes it really hard for it to be economically viable. It needs a little bit, uh, to be able to get things quickly to the market when the market asks for it, you want to have, it, have a little grain feeding. Not much, but a little. Data shows, on this case, where a little grain feeding doesn't really have that big impact on the environment, and you, it doesn't change the quality of the meat health-wise. But it's a case of a regulation potentially being dogmatic because it just wants to be absolute. And I think that for a lot of our practices, if instead of organic being an ideology and factory being an ideology, you instead had outcomes. What's the outcome you want? The outcome you want is the healthiest possible meat with the least use of carbon and water and land. And then take those as your measurable outcomes and find the system that creates those as opposed to falling into labels. So we, we, we're, we label our agriculture when we should make it really outcome oriented with data. And we can collect, there's nothing you can collect better data than for than agriculture. You guys are around the world in, in how many countries? 37. 37 countries. And what you spelled out this evening looked pretty much uh, United States oriented in terms of population and cities and things like that. Do you have completely different issues in different parts of the world? Not at all. So, you know, they, they, we already went through our urbanization. Um, China has gone through urbanization. Africa hasn't yet. Africa Africa's the, the continent that's, that's, that's I think they're 37% urban. I can't remember the figures exactly. Mm -hmm. but, but this urbanization trend is global, and what that means for the populations is hugely, is, is, is going to um, be hugely important. Similarly, um, the, you know, the, 
the, you, when people live as farmers or on the land, they have some sort of connection to nature. When they move into the cities, when Africa urbanizes, and as China has urbanized, you, you end up with a totally different sense of the, of the environment. That's going to be common. The, um, I, I think the tension between economic growth and corporations and the environment, that certainly exists in China. China actually is more environmental than you might think because they've seen the pollution and, they, and they've seen how damaging it is. And their struggle is how can they have economic growth and befriend corporations but still be environmental? That's a problem that applies in every continent and every country we work. Does China focus on biodiversity and wildlands and things like that? Um, I, I, when I first got hired by Nature Conservancy, I went to China to teach a course in conservation. And I was, by our connections, I had to do it for their government, sort of high-level government people. And I started talking about biodiversity. They had no interest. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, they, it, they were just, what is it? They, didn't, they had no idea what it was. They have a thing called ec ec ecosystem function, and Ooh. they define ecosystem functions. Which that they sounds like you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I stole it from China. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and they cared about it a lot. I could get the species back into it by not talking about biodiversity. I, I, I find biodiversity a little abstract, but I got species in it, like the, the golden Yunnan monkey or mushrooms. China has a tremendous, you can go to restaurants in China and all that you eat is mushrooms, you know, dessert mushrooms, mushrooms that taste like steak, mushrooms, you know, just all sorts of mushrooms. They export them to Japan, make a lot of money off them. That's diverse. And they have a real sense of mushroom diversity. Hmm. So we could, you can actually get them interested in mushroom diversity, but not biodiversity in our abstract way of thinking about it. Yeah, because, um, you know, the mycelium uh, maniacs could just right. kind of lead the way there. Um, Stephen has a political question. The people fighting conservation are powerful, zealous, unethical, and single-minded in their attacks on conservation. If conservationists are reasonable, they will lose. By de-radicalizing the environmental left and pushing the left toward the center, aren't you just paving the way for a victory by the unreasonable ultra-right? <laughs> uh, I actually don't see it. So when, when I first went to work for the conservancy, I was... Um, you, you know, I, I was very, uh, you know, that's why I testified against Spotted Owls. You know, I, I wanted to be out there on the barricades. And I went to work, and I actually was put on the board for the conservancy, not work for them. And I went in there thinking, all these corporate guys, you know, what, what are they like? You know, and I, was, I went in there with the worst possible expectations. I interviewed them all. I keep little notebooks, and I'd ask them over drinks, why do you do this? Without exception, and my sample size is like 40 or 50. They had deeply personal reasons. They were, they were reasons that often had to do with their kids, and they wanted their kids to see something or have an experience. They were very humane. And I, and I, it, it, and I, it, I stopped demonizing them. Mm -hmm. I, don't th I, I think it does you no service to demonize your opposition, and I'm not being a goody-goody there. I'm you know, cynical about working with Dow. I know Dow has to make a lot of money. I know that. I know they're going to have to make decisions. But they're also well-intended humans. They want to do, nobody wants a worse world. Nobody actually wants to destroy the world, you know. Maybe they want to make money, and it's a trade-off, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's, I just don't see it as that good and evil. And that's the problem. Um, related question, I think, from Lorraine Palmer. Please comment on the inalienable right of non-human species to inhabit this planet and thrive not in service to humans, but simply to live their lives. So I personally think as a value, I mean, the way I think about that is we um, should not be res responsible for the extinction of a species. You know, you know, that's my value. I do not, but that's a value. And a different culture and a different country might have a different value. That's a value decision. And I'm not going to impose my value on them. The metaphor, I don't know if I use it, we, we use it in the book and other people have used it. You know, to, to some people, if, you, if, you, if to save a thousand kids, you had to, for some perverse reason, extinguish a, a, a species that had already been dwindled down to a few hundred individuals, you know, what, what choice would you make? People would have a hard time making that choice. So it, that is a value question, 
and it's my personal value, but I, I think it has to be decided by political process in any country. We've decided by our political process because of the Endangered Species Act, we feel that way, but other countries may not. Does it make a difference? Um, one of the things I run into is, is trying to um, often does astoundingly green things in at a startlingly fast rate and a large scale. Um, and one notices that the entire Politburo is uh, run by people trained as engineers and scientists. Uh, this is not the case in the United States where an entire Politburo is, is uh, lawyers. Um, <laughs> Should we be getting more scientists and, and engineers uh, and people of those backgrounds in political office as well as being appointed to things? Well, at the Conservancy, there's probably six scientists for every lawyer. Good ratio. But, um, Good ratio. Yeah. Uh, you, know, I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure scientists are, are any wiser about these issues either. I might, if I, I might want anthropologists. Anthropologists. A I, nation I mean, run by anthropologists. Yeah. Boy, there's a <laughs> formula for argument. <laughs> Kevin Kelly has a question. It's probably a good last question for the evening. Can you paint a picture of your best case scenario of successful conservation in an urban planet over 200 years? This is the Long Now Foundation. So what does a long-term high-tech ecotopia look like? So I... I well, I love the idea of ecotopia. But I think you know, the, the, the high-tech ecotopia is cities that are infused with parks so that people come in contact with nature. I mean, all, all the riparian zones, all the rivers restored, no reason they couldn't be. Hmm. Uh, so cities rich with parks, things that, are, that you know, I know they're not pristine, but wilderness areas that, that somehow allow urban people to get to them. Agriculture that is conducted to maximize yield and minimize water and energy use, which again, as I say, is, is, that's an output. That's not organic agriculture, and it's not industrial agriculture. It's an output you can engineer towards with technology. Um, and, if, and I think there's a lot of degrees of freedom. Um, the planet still isn't that overloaded, and the population is going to level off soon. And mining and energy extraction situations where if the mining and extraction is done in a case where it really will do damage that is really slow to recover from, then offset payments. Offset payments extracted from those corporations to pay for restoration elsewhere. It still leaves them plenty of money to make a lot of profit. That would be basically my ingredients. How about the oceans? It's, it's, so as you... In, in the oceans, the buzzword now is ocean zoning or marine spatial planning. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly what Noah and Jane Luchenko and is being pushed all around. That's very much that idea in the oceans, too. Mm -hmm. You will succeed in the oceans not by telling people they can't fish, but by telling people they can for sure fish here, but over here they can't. You, gotta, you, you can't just be that stop sign. It's got to be a stop sign with a green light in the oceans as well. So you quote Eleanor Ostrom. Nobel Prize winning sort of economist who talks about <laughs> managing the commons. Um, I guess it's the scale that Kevin's talking about, which is planet scale and multi-century scale. What is managing the commons made of? Is, is this a form of governance that is uh, extremely local and grassrootsy, somewhat global? Um, what are we looking at here to manage the commons at, at planet scale in the Anthropocene? So, you know, there's all sorts of futurists that write about this. My own little futurist vision of that is that our, you know, social networking, our, uh, you know, these things. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, it's like my idea for, for, for climate change is it's so hard for people to, to believe in cli that climate change is happening is, is I would like to have an app. And the app allows you to take pictures of birds. The birds are easy. Hmm. And I p I'd pick the set of species. It gives a GPS coordinates. You know exactly where it is, and you know that its range is expanding. And you create a community that, through this, is aware of ch you're part of tracking what's going on in your environment. And I think the social net. You know, it's not. I Bill McKibben calls them iPad idiots, and I think he's an idiot for saying that because we have to embrace 
uh, that culture. That's the, you know, that's where we're going to get the, the sense of community um, is, is if people feel connected this way and could share data and could share information. I bet you if we got this iPad, I don't know what species I'd pick, but I bet you if I got this set up and you could take pictures of birds and you could find out this is the northernmost this has ever been. And that was broadcast all over the world. You know, and there were other people other places saying, this is the northernmost I'd ever get. It would, people would suddenly say, wow, things are changing. And it would become real to them. And they'd become you know, part of that. So that's my futurist vision. Thank you. <laughs> that's great.